You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. And on this episode, we talk about video game addiction. Now, some of you guys, some of my loyal listeners may remember back on episode 28, where we had Dr. Greenfield talking about internet addiction. That was such a, a great episode, one of our highest rated episodes. But after doing several school presentations, you know, I wanted to discuss video game addictions because this is something that a lot of middle school kids and high school kids are dealing with. So in order to jump into this subject, I brought one of Dr. Greenfield's colleagues, Dr. Clifford Sussman, to be on this show. And Clifford treats hundreds of kids in his practice that suffer from video game addiction. And on this podcast, you will hear Clifford talk about some of the consequences of video game addiction, how to treat it how to prevent it as a parent, and if your child's addicted to video games, how to go to your insurance provider to get them to pay for the treatment that they need. So I hope you really enjoy this show. Let's jump into it with Clifford. Hey, Clifford, welcome to the Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on the show today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Clifford, you know, we want to get your background story. It's so fascinating how you got into the whole field of addiction and video game addiction. How did you start out in this field? Well, you know, I, I as a child and adolescent psychiatrist in a private practice doing psychotherapy and medication management combined with most of my clients, I was really focusing in on teenagers and young adults and uh, I had a background myself in uh, programming and designing video games. I was a gamer myself, and uh, I had done some educational software for children before becoming before going to medical school. Uh, so, in the, in like the first seven years of my practice, I've been in practice now for almost ten years. I found that very often, especially with my ADHD and high-functioning autism clients, which were a large percentage of my practice, very often parents would be coming in and saying, you know, my kid's addicted to video games, my kid's addicted to Minecraft, my kid's addicted to social media, you know, my my kid's addicted to Call of Duty. And, and you know, even even some young adults were like, yeah, I dropped out of school because I spent a whole week on Skyrim or you know, and and um, it, it just got to be such a common chief complaint. I, I figured, you know, I really got to learn how to treat this because we never got any training in residency. Um, it's a very um, uh, under researched area, uh, but I but I you know I learned what I could about the research that was out there, and I had a background in motivational interviewing as well, which is a type of therapy designed to treat. Uh, techno- are designed to treat um, drug and alcohol addiction. Right, the substance abuse community. Right, right. So it sort of all fit together for me. Uh, you know, like a light went off that, you know, I could just treat this and it would still, and, and, and you know, it's uh, all my new, you know, I've been taking for the last three years uh, almost exclusively uh, internet and video game problem users as my uh, new patients. And uh, despite that, I feel that uh, there's still, it, it's still very undertreated in the community. There's still a lot more demand than there are providers who will treat it. So let me ask you a question, Clifford. When a, when a parent calls you up or when a parent comes into your office, like how, how do you make the determination that is actual addiction Opposed mm-hmm. to a kid just spending unsupervised time on their video game system. Right. Well, I feel the most useful definition of addiction, uh, since many of the things that people get addicted to have a final common pathway in the brain, I feel the, the most useful definition of addiction is when you keep you, uh, doing a compulsive behavior um, despite its negative consequences on your life. Uh, And there have to be negative consequences on your life for it to be addiction. And despite awareness of those negative consequences, you're not able to control your behavior. You're not able to stop. And so, you know, the the first thing I look at is how is their technology use impacting their life? Because it's, it's, um, you know, most... 
most kids are spending way more hours on technology than they used to. And I mean, you could make the case that even using the definition I just gave you, that as a society, we're all sort of functional techaholics. Correct. You know, we all are, are at the very least dependent on technology. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard to find anyone who, who has never had technology negatively impact their life in some way. Um, you know, and and uh, and found that they had you know, and didn't find that they had difficulty uh, reducing the amount they were using. So, um, I try to take the cases where where I see the most severe um, consequences uh, to their lives. And what are some of the consequences that you're seeing with uh, these kids or young adults who are coming to your um, office? You know, with these issues. Yeah. So with the with the kids, I see, you know, obviously poor grades uh, or or drastic sudden declines in grades is a big red flag. I see um, uh, social isolation. Um, you can see a psychological sequelae such as depression and anxiety. Um, you know, like increased social anxiety, for example. Uh, so. Um, you see, you see a lot more fighting within the family. You can see aggression caused by withdrawal, you know, or irritability um, when parents ask kids to get off. Um, you know, loss of interest in other activities. Um, you know, maybe qu people will qu quit their sports teams, for example. Uh, in young adults, I see a lot of dropping out of college, failure to launch, living in the parents' basement, things like that. So let me let me go back to the aggression question, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, you're saying that like you see the aggression when it comes from the withdrawal. In other words, parents are saying you need to unplug, you need to eat dinner, you need to do whatever yep. in the house. So it's not necessarily the type of game they're playing that, that you're seeing the violence. It's more from the withdrawal system, symptoms of stopping the video game play. Yeah, theoretically, that's exactly right. That that it has a lot more to do with with what's going on neurobiologically. Um, that it's that it's a very natural response to um, to stop to stopping, especially after you've been on for hours and hours and hours on end. Uh, you know, and you'll see holes in walls from kids' fists and things like that, um, and and uh, all sorts of battles with parents. Then you also talked about, you know, the kids having, you know, social anxiety issues um, mm -hmm. as a component of the extended use of playing the game. Uh, a quick question would be, what about the games that have a social component where kids are in like, you know, social chat rooms, they're playing right. with other kids online? Do they still have those social anxiety issues, even though they're socially involved with other kids while playing? Right. Well, it's. And that's a great question because it's actually often because of social anxiety issues that they use technology to socialize in the first place. Because um, using, t you know, technology is uh, in many ways a safe haven from many of the social challenges of the real world. Um, for example, you know, I feel a lot of my high functioning autistic clients are drawn to social games and social media because uh, it kind of levels the playing field. They don't have to make eye contact. Um, you know, they can text what they want to talk about instead of having to verbalize it. Uh, they can, um, uh, you know, it's, it's almost got like its own language to it. Um, you, you can um, uh, have all these friends that you might not have in real life. You know, you can feel accepted. Um, you can get liked. Uh, and, and you see visual representations of how much you're liked, so you don't have to, so it doesn't have to be as ambiguous. Um, you know, there's a lot of social reinforcement, uh, and you feel connected to a lot of peers, and you don't feel like you're missing out. Right. Because you're avoiding all these social interactions in the real world, you know, it's both a, 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 an effect of social anxiety and a cause of social anxiety, because the more you avoid anything, the more uncomfortable it makes you it's sort of a safe haven for those type of kids who are dealing with those issues mm -hmm. yeah and i mean not not to say that only kids with high functioning autism are drawn to it for that reason i think it's a more comfortable place for for all sorts of kids to socialize even some of the most popular kids 
Now, let me ask you a question when it comes to the addiction. Do you see any difference between the equipment? Like, are kids more addicted to game consoles opposed mm-hmm. to games that are being played on cell phones, or is it about the same? Well, you know, as far as the trends of what I see, um, I see a lot of both. Uh, it's, you know, it's hard to say which one's more common because, you know, pretty much everyone has a cell phone now. I So, you know, you'd, you'd have to sort of analyze it by the ratio of how many people have it to how many people get addicted by it. But from a neurobiological perspective, uh, the and, and I believe uh, Dr. David Greenfield mentioned in this to you as well, the, the most important factor in what makes something addictive is the delay in time between when you go to seek the, uh, you know, whatever it is that you crave and um, when you actually, re- and when you actually receive it. So the latency, in other words, um, for example, the time between when you light your cigarette and the time when you get a buzz from your cigarette. Uh, so the shorter that time is, the more addictive something is. So in theory, you could make the case that cell phones you would predict to be more addictive because there's a very short latency. You can just whip it right out of your pocket the minute you want to get stimulated by it and turn it right on and you're instantly online, whereas, you know, platforms Form games to take take a while to boot up. Having said that, once you're already online, um, both environments have many many factors that make them addictive. And you know, if you think about by the time you're online, you know, both in a platform environment and in a cell phone environment, you're going to get lots of instant gratification. You're going to get a very the, the delays will be very short between the first episode of simulation and the next episode of stimulation, depending on what content you're using on these. So, um, and there's also a lot of psychological factors that make content addictive. So, you know, it probably, once you're on, it probably has a lot more to do with the content than the platform. Yeah. The reason I asked that question, cause I, I want to, for parents to understand that there can be addiction to games on the cell phone. Cause there's a lot of times I think parents think that addiction only takes place at the house on the gaming console, but mm-hmm. that's not actually the case. You can make it army not like you all. just brilliantly talked about is that you can have even more addiction on the cell phone. Like you can have a kid at class or at college playing nonstop outside of the household. Yeah. Well, you bring up a very important point that not only are, can cell phones be extremely addictive um, in the same way platforms are, but because they're so portable, it's like you're bringing your addiction. You can bring your addiction, or you can bring your addictive behavior into virt- into pretty much any environment, uh, including school. So it can become a huge distraction. Um, you know, even teachers who have like a no cell phone in the class policy, their students will come in and tell me that they're, you know, they have a book open with a cell phone in it, or that they have a cell phone under their desk that they're looking at during class. Uh, and, and I mean, most, most kids will tell you that's pretty common. So the next question would be, um, when it comes to the addiction, do you see like, like VR playing an important part of it? Like kids, we have virtual reality games, Uh people are using the VR goggles. Is that adding to this problem? Well, it might add a psychological component in that one of the things that makes, um, digital technology so stimulating in general is that it can be an escape from reality and uh that so so uh especially if your reality is very tough to deal with and not quite as stimulating uh so you know it's or if you're trying to avoid that reality so you know virtual reality uh like those those uh, goggles you put on, for example, it just makes the the environment you're in you're more immersed in it. It's more of an escape. Um, I don't have like a lot of research data on whether those games are more addictive, uh, so it's sort of just theoretical what I'm talking about. But you know, just not to be mistaken, I mean, you certainly don't need the virtual reality component to have addictive technology. And also, you know, we're starting to see like a lot of information out there about how, you know, porn companies are targeting video gamers because 
of the increase of dopamine that's being released when you're playing these games. Mm-hmm. They're putting ads in like a lot of online games because they're trying to stimulate mm-hmm. the kids where they're already high off the dopamine to kind of switch over yeah. to their platform. Are you starting to see that with some of your clients? Well, I mean, I've seen I've seen clients exclusively for porn addiction. Uh, um, you know, I I don't see a ton of people who cross over from one to the other, but they but I expect to see more of that in the future because I know they're developing more and more. Not not only people who not not just the advertising in video games, but they're developing pornographic games um, or putting more adult content in video games. Um, so. The, the porn industry is, uh, I believe it's w- one of the biggest industries in the world, uh, especially online porn. Um, it's, it's a huge profit making industry and, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, and it is powered. I mean, uh, you know, putting, moving the content online has, um, has has made the porn industry so much more profitable because of all the the things we talked about about the instant gratification and the more instant gratification you get the the less you have to wait for your stimulation whether it be porn or video games the more of a dopamine boost you're going to get and um so so uh you know I think what you said is you know maybe very true in theory I just don't have a lot of hard data on it yeah, I just think it's, you know, really important for parents to kind of understand, like you're saying, with, you know, these virtual reality games that it's coming as well. It's already here. It's only going to be more popular where you parents are going to have to start really monitoring like these game consoles mm-hmm. and these, these you know, these uh, equipment because it's going to be on the VR goggles where, you know, kids are going to be able to put goggles on. They can just see whatever pornographic video they want to see straight from the goggles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's absolutely true. So, so what are some tips for parents, um, Clifford, that they could take away? Or what are some of the tips that you give parents of how to control this? Or when it's right. out of the parents' control, where they need to go to a professional yeah. like yourself? Right, right. So I guess that's that's um, important to distinguish is, you know, for, for parents. You know, some parents I'm just educating in general on, on healthy use for their kids and other parents – you know, uh, they're, I'm dealing with their their children who who have much more serious problems, and and I think uh, it is important for parents first to make that distinction. You know, is this something they should be handling by themselves, or should they be going to a professional? And I think again, it comes down to how severe are the problems in in your child's lives caused by this. You know, how many hours are they online not getting other things done? And it's not just the time kids spend online. I, I think. You know, to make that assessment, parents have to realize that it's not just the hours that kids spend online that um, impairs them. It's also the residual effects on their brain when they're done online. For example, uh, they may be more bored, less stimulated by everyday life because we, we talked about all that dopamine that's coming out. Well, what happens is dopamine receptors get downregulated, meaning that you become desensitized to pleasure. In other words, it takes more pleasure to give you pleasure when you game a lot or when you're online a lot, For especially if it's for many hours in a row, many days in a row. Uh, so now you're desensitized to pleasure and, you know, you, you, you seek stimulation. It's almost like, you know, uh, it, it can cause a sort of artificial or worsened ADHD state. And so, you know, if, if, if kids are, again, like more irritable and in withdrawal when they're not on games or they're just not interested in anything else, um, this could very much be a residual effect of the gaming um, because they, they have developed a higher tolerance for pleasure. So that's one thing for parents to look for in deciding whether to get help or not. Now, as far as, you know, just educating parents in general, I think it's important for them to learn to set age appropriate limits for their kids. Uh, they can't, you know, they have to understand the, the normal development of teenagers and how, you know, when they, when they go through puberty and adolescence and then into young adulthood, there's changes in the way people uh, relate to their peers and the demands on them to be independent. Uh, and, and there's, there's a, a sort of healthy ambivalence where part of you 
is trying to become independent and part of you still feels you need to be dependent on your parents. So you're being torn in two directions. And I think that parents need to use interventions that keep those things in mind. If I think parents that try to police and monitor their kids too much when they're older uh, find that it doesn't really work, that kids will just do the opposite or they'll sneak or they'll hack or they'll find ways to get around it. And uh, it's it's very important for parents to see the value of kids being able, especially older kids, being able to self-monitor, especially because they're going to go off to college soon and be completely on their own anyway. So I think it's important for older teens to be educated and to know what they're doing to themselves. And, um, you know, to, to, for example, on my website, I have some, some educational videos, uh, um, YouTube videos that I tried to make appealing to, uh, both parents and gamers. Um, and they're very short and they, 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 like one of them, for example, shows the effect of the brain on, um, uh, uh, of, of using excessive technology. And, and that's at Clifford Sussman, MD.com. You can get access to those videos, but, uh, you know, I think that's the type of education that teenagers need to have so that they're more inclined to self-regulate. Um, aside from that, I think it's important for parents to uh, set good examples for their kids, to have a, 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 a you know, it's very hard to uh, for people to change without changing their routine, their structure, their environment. It's very hard for people to change on willpower bel- alone. So I think it's important for parents to you know, maybe look at their own technology use and how it's influencing their kids. I think it's important for them to give more structure to their kids, more structured activities to get them out of the house, uh, to, um, uh, maybe have a tech free zone in the house, a room full of board games. And there's a lot of wonderful new board games out there, There uh, books, you know, non, non non-technology types of entertainment, um, where you put your cell phone at the door, perhaps, and go into that room, and you know maybe no no cell phones at dinner, for example, at the table. You know, uh, uh, you can you can have your child do their homework in a library, so they don't have as many distractions, or they may even opt to do that if they re- if they have the insight that it's a problem for them. So there's a lot of um, sort of environmental changes that can help. I, I think power struggles often don't help, though, with older kids. That's the point I'm trying to make. When you say older kids, you mean you're like 14 and up? Yeah, yeah. And even, even 11, 12, and 13, um, I mean, they're the ones who get into power struggles the most. Uh, you know, I think even at that age, there, there's a way to, to talk to kids that, you know, will, will, there, there's a way to intervene that, that that's more that's going to get, you're going to get more mileage out of, um, as opposed to just, you know, uh, uh, you know, just telling them what they shouldn't do all the time, which, which may be more appropriate with younger children where you have to say like, you know, look, you're, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, no, my four-year-old can't use my cell phone. <laughs> you know, right, right. I'm not going to give him my cell phone as a virtual babysitter, or you know, or, or let them watch it uh, while they're eating so they'll eat more. Like those are those are not good ways to for parents to use technology on younger kids. And one last cl- question, Clifford, is about um, insurance because parents mm-hmm. may not think that you know this type of behavior is covered with their insurance. If parents have like a regular PPO or if a parent is receiving Medicaid, is video Mm -hmm. game addiction covered by insurance companies? Well, that's a good question. I think that there is. um, So insurance companies started going with ICD codes instead of DSM codes. And there is an ICD code now for excessive gaming. I believe it's just for gaming, uh, not for other forms of technology use. Sure, um, which is good because the DSM does not yet have an official diagnosis for technology addiction. So, you know, whether an insurance company will cover a code like that, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm out of network myself, but 
Now, a huge percentage of kids with this problem carry an, uh, some other psychiatric diagnosis, like it could be, uh, you know, anxiety and, uh, and, and, you know, these labels, uh, uh, you know, however, wh- you know, whether good or bad, these labels mean, mean a lot more to insurance companies than they do to psychiatrists. Sure. Because we're really just treating symptoms, right? you know, but, but we have to know these labels because otherwise, you know, insurance companies won't pay for it. Uh, so, um, you know, but, but, but kids may come in with ADHD or anxiety or other problems and you can, as long as you have a primary billing code, insurance will cover it. Um, so, you know, if you, if insurance, if an insurance company won't cover that ICD code for gaming, they, they'll probably cover one of these other codes. And so, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to get help because you think insurance isn't going to cover it. No, I was um, I was wondering maybe do you recommend you know as a psychiatrist should they get uh-huh. you know um, a psychiatric workup or, or psychological if they if the parents are starting to see these very negative yeah. uh, impacts so that you can really see what's yeah. going on with the kid. Right, right. I mean, you know, I think that ideal in an ideal world you know, depending on how severe the problems are, uh, you might need both a psychiatric evaluation by someone like myself who knows about this problem, as well as psychoeducational testing by a psychologist to rule out things like ADHD and learning disabilities, um, or at least to get the quantity of how severe, uh, their their executive functioning difficulties are, for example, um, and to get a realistic sense of what their abilities should be and how short they're falling of their potential. So all of these things uh, can be valuable tools for evaluating. And I think it depends on the situation of the child and how, how severe it is. And, of, and unfortunately, it also depends on what resources parents have. And, you know, actually, it's there, there's some... Uh, there, there was some work, some research done that showed that in uh, poor communities that have less access to mental health care, that technology addiction issues are probably worse. Oh wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, because and and often it's because parents, you know. You know, maybe they're single parents and they're leaving and, uh, you know, they, they have less time with their kids. And so they, again, they have to go with that virtual babysitter, you know, leave them on the phone or the computer while you're gone. You know, there may not be as much supervision and monitoring. Well, Clifford, you gave us a lot of great information on this show. I think, you know, parents are going to walk away with a game plan of how to deal with this. If their kids are addicted, where can they, I know you gave your website. If you give your website again and let parents know where they can find you on social media, that'd be great. Yeah, it's www.cliffordsussmanmd.com. It has a link to my videos and my upcoming uh, presentations, as well as uh, information on how to get in touch with me. Um, so, you know, rather than going directly to YouTube, you can you can get links to my YouTube videos there. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, people get a chance to check them out. Well, great. We really appreciate you being on the show, Clifford. All right. Thank you for having me. Hey, guys, I hope you really enjoyed that episode with Dr. Clifford Sussman. I think he gave us a lot of a lot of interventions to walk away with and give us a game plan going into the holidays of how we're going to deal with the screen time. And what we're going to do, we see these signs of Internet addiction or video game addiction. And make sure you go to his website, Clifford Sussman, M.D., the C-L-I-F-F-O-R-D-S-U-S-S-M-A-N, md.com to get more information and look at some of his helpful videos where he really breaks down this phenomenon of video game addiction and always make sure you go to itunes and rate the digital parent podcast and let us know what you thought about this episode for clifford until the next time